from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, K-State's Kurt Thompson addresses the importance of controlling kochia on crop ground over the next few weeks ahead of spring planting, especially in light of kochia's buildup of resistance to glyphosate. He talks about the herbicide options for extended kochia control based on what crop will follow. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth responds to a bevy of questions he's been getting from crop growers about the sharp cold weather earlier in the month and whether those low temperatures took a toll on overwintering insects in winter wheat and alfalfa stands. He also reports that the wheat curl mite has spread wheat streak mosaic disease even further east in Kansas now. And later, with Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. All here on agriculture today agricultural producers landowners and creditors you have a partner in your legal and financial needs kansas agricultural mediation services offers reliable trusted information and guidance whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner kansas agricultural mediation services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business to learn more call 800-321-3276 or visit us online on this segment we'll tackle a perpetual weed problem we find in many parts of kansas and it has become more formidable in that it's developed resistance to one of our more important herbicide products that we use that being glyphosate and we're referring to kochia and why there's a window of opportunity to jump on this weed in these coming weeks. Joining us once again is weed management specialist Kurt Thompson of K-State Research and Extension. And Kurt, you want producers to be heads up on this weed even though they think they may be in the clear coming out of last fall. Yeah, it's one of those weeds that can actually uh, bite you. You know, last fall when you had harvest, there might not have been a kochia in the field. But just the nature of that weed and its ability to break off and roll around the countryside, spreading seed everywhere, go out and take a look at that wheat stubble or take a look at row crop stocks. Take a look and see what kind of kochia is trapped in that residue and if you see kosher trapped in that residue it contains seed so it means what we're going to talk about today applies to uh, to all of those folks right and heap on top of that then this ever growing issue with glyphosate resistance in many pockets around Kansas now right yeah we're finding that you know glyphosate applications anymore are generally not that effective on kosher And so, yeah, there's some other things that we need to do. And part of the philosophy is if we never let kosher get out of the ground, I think we can manage it. And that gets right to why this is a consideration right now, as opposed to waiting until springtime. These next few weeks do extend that opportunity to suppress kosher before it even gets going. That's the uh, tactic. Eric, that's absolutely right. And we know that Kochia is a very early germinator come February. Sometime in February, we may start to see some kochia. And as we move into March, uh, we definitely see kochia on through a lot of April. Uh, we see a lot of kochia emergence. So our, our goal is to have an herbicide in place, activated and in the soil, so that when that kochia germinates, uh, we can control it. Getting right to those herbicide options. Twofold, and the first component of the plan is, in fact, dicamba. Yeah, I think in almost every case, and we'll talk about a couple exceptions here after a bit, but we will want dicamba tank mixed with some other residual product. And the reason being is when we put a herbicide program out there, we want to be able to be controlling kochia when we get two-tenths or a quarter inch of precip, and the only product that we can use to actually accomplish that is dicamba. So dicamba is an essential component of the mixture. But this is a two-tiered program, dicamba and something else to extend to that residual control in effect then. Yeah, of course, if if we happen to get significant precip between uh, now and, and the end of April, which 
could happen. Uh, we need to have some additional products out there that give you extended residual control after the dicamba either leaches out or runs out. And those other products then will be predicated by the cropping intent for that acreage. And we might just walk through those possibilities, as depicted, by the way, in an e-update article from K-State on this very topic we're going to point folks toward here a little later on. If you're going to either corn or sorghum on that ground, what is that other herbicide that should be included in the mix? Well, probably uh, number one and most reasonably priced would be good old atrazine. Getting a pound of atrazine out there with that dicamba really does set us up for controlling these weeds ahead of corn or ahead of grain sorghum. Yep. So that's a standard. If one is definitely going to corn, though, that, you say, may open up some other options? Yeah, it opens up a number of additional opportunities than, than just atrazine, although a little atrazine with some of these products is also uh, very good. But you can use ahead of corn things like Corvus, Balance Flex. You can use Authority MTZ, which is allowed ahead of corn. We can use products like Zidua, Zidua Atrazine. Those kinds of things can give some extended good kosher control even after the dicamba component has wore out. So pick and choose here and uh, figure out which of those options best suit your field situations going to corn. If one is going to be leaving that acreage fallow for a few months, then planting to winter wheat. Now the alternatives change a bit, you say? They do because uh, atrazine all of a sudden drops out of the picture. And uh, we'd encourage folks to uh, consider including metribuzin or products that contain metribuzin. You know, putting, uh, oh, eight ounces of the dry metribuzin product out there with some Banville still allows us to come back to wheat this fall. Uh, there's some additional products like uh, Scoparia, which basically contains isoxaflutol, the component in, say, a Balance Flex with a little metribuzin, uh, can be an excellent treatment, as well as Authority MTZ. Authority MTZ has two uh, components in it, sulfentrazone and the uh, metribuzin. And we have good old Zidua. And Zidua with a little metribuzin and dicamba can also be uh, an excellent treatment, giving you some extended residual control into the summer ahead of planting wheat this fall. And if one is going to sunflowers in western Kansas particularly, again, your herbicide selection will be modified a touch more, will it not? Uh, it will. When we look at sunflowers, all of a sudden we can no longer use Banville in the mix. And that's unfortunate, but we haven't been able to convince the people who write the labels uh, for dicamba to allow uh, dicamba to be used even early. So about all we can do is put on products that contain sulfentrazone, that is the Spartan or generic Spartans, and get them activated so that they're controlling kochia. Zidua also can be put on early ahead of sunflowers and be effective, but we've got to have some significant rainfall. And so if they're going to sunflowers, man, I would get those treatments on as soon as possible to try to catch significant rain for activation. And lastly, soybeans. We have kochia starting to really assert itself in areas even in central Kansas where soybeans are more populous. But for those who are planning to extend that soybean region a little further west yet, there are some alternatives here as well for suppressing kochia. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of glitches in soybean production as well. If you are in areas that have less than 25 inches of annual precipitation, Technically, we cannot use dicamba in a pre-plant scenario or early pre-plant scenario ahead of soybeans. And so, I mean, growers know where they're at in terms of, of long-term annual precip 
Uh, if they're less than that, we're kind of in the same boat as we were with sunflowers. We have to get an authority-based product down. That's the sulfentrazone. Or if they want to use a valor-based product, it's really important to use valor-based products that also include uh, metribuzin. Uh, metribuzin is another product that can be uh, very effective and Authority MTZ, of course, has a sulfentrazone and, and metribuzin in it. Those all can be very effective. And if you're far enough to the east and have 25 inches of annual rainfall or more, then you can also include dicamba, which I would strongly recommend. It's obvious, Kurt, that the producer needs to strategize as they consider this pre-plant application against kochia in their crops, whatever they might be this spring or in the case of winter wheat planted this fall. But the information is out there for them to assemble this control program successfully, right? I think we have the tools. If we can get proper timing, a little cooperation from Mother Nature, we're well on our way to managing kochia. There is an article on this topic, Late Winter Pre-Plant Applications for Kochia Control, in the most recent Agronomy e-Update newsletter dated last Friday, January the 19th. That is at agronomy.ksu.edu. Moreover, all of the information on your herbicide options for this particular project are fully outlined based on K-State research trials and the Chemical Weed Control Guide. From K-State, the 2018 edition is now out, and ask your local extension office about that, or again, go to agronomy.ksu.edu for the online version. Kurt, thanks. We appreciate it, as always. Our pleasure. He's a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. That's Kurt Thompson on Kosha Control Strategizing. Here ahead of the spring planting season, you're listening to Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and our guest now, well, despite the winter, knows no season because he's getting questions about potential impacts of the recent cold around Kansas on crop insect activity, believe it or not. Jeff Whitworth joins us once more, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. Jeff, you do have producers inquiring about how that harsh cold we saw a couple of weeks ago and then these fluctuations in temperatures may be affecting quite an assortment of insects that might be out there now. Uh, That's exactly right. Good morning, Eric. Um, You know, every year we have different type of weather in the winter, right, And as we do in the summer. And everybody's always curious how that's going to affect the pests that are out there. Uh, The first thing I will say is after having done this for a long time, If we have insects in Kansas and they overwinter in Kansas, cold and or hot temperatures during the winter are probably not going to affect the populations. When it actually affects the populations, after we break dormancy in our crops like alfalfa or wheat, if we get a really cold snap then that actually affects the crops, it will probably affect the insects. But generally, they're very well adapted to the differences in temperature, the vagaries we get uh, from year to year. So it really overall is probably not going to bother them. But some of the ones I've gotten questions about specifically are some of the ones that we went into the fall with pretty good populations. Number one, I've received several calls in the last month about the painted lady butterfly or the thistle caterpillar Mm -hmm. that we saw so much of last summer in soybeans. First of all, I've not seen populations in soybeans uh, of thistle caterpillars like we saw last year. We had two complete generations at least in the soybeans. 
and it dribbled over into almost a third generation. And then we saw the butterflies, the painted lady butterflies, all fall. So the, a lot of the growers were wanting to know if those populations are going to develop again next year in those same fields. And I don't think so. Number one, like I said, I've not seen populations like that before in Kansas. But number two, they don't overwinter in Kansas. So when they migrate to their overwintering sites, it's just a matter of whether they find those same fields and if those same fields are planted in soybeans when they migrate back next summer and if they come here into Kansas and those numbers, et cetera. So I would say probably not, but they don't overwinter in Kansas. So it's a crapshoot next year whether they're going to be in those fields or not. Mm -hmm. Same with green clover worms. I get a lot of calls about green clover worms because the guys were seeing a lot of adults fly up as they were harvesting their soybeans. And so they've been wanting to know if they're laying eggs and they're going to overwinter in, in those same fields. Again, with the green clover worm, they don't overwinter in Kansas. So it's just a matter of wherever they land when they come back in next next summer to lay their eggs. The other one that I, I get a lot of calls about or that I have gotten a lot of calls about are armyworms. Uh, the armyworms are really affecting different wheat fields going into the fall. And they can affect brome. They can affect lots of different plants, but especially wheat. And they're well adapted as opposed to the other two, aren't they? Well, the army worm will feed in wheat till uh, we get cold weather. And then they, again, they don't overwinter in Kansas. At least we don't think they do. The um, fall army worm, same thing. If it's an army cut worm, they do overwinter in Kansas. So it can be the army worm, the fall army worm, or the army cutworm feeding in your fields in the fall. That's why you got to get out and make the distinction what it is. If it's army worm or fall army worm, they're probably not going to overwinter. Now, I say that because, you know, these insects are adapting and changing, but so far we haven't seen them overwinter. The army cutworm will. So if you have a place out in your wheat and or canola or your yard or any place else because they will feed on anything green in the fall, they can overwinter. Anytime temperatures are over. 45, 48 degrees, they can feed, and then they'll be out there in the spring when it breaks dormancy, when the whatever crop it is, when it breaks dormancy. So they can be a problem. So it's a matter of getting out and properly identifying what the worm is that's eating in your wheat or your alfalfa uh, into the fall. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other pests, though, that the cold weather might not have made any kind of dent in. And We've talked to winter grain mites out there coming into this winter season. They're probably going to endure these conditions fairly well, aren't they? Oh, yeah. The two mite problem, the main mite problems we have in Kansas or we have had in the last year is the winter grain mite and the uh, wheat curl mite. The winter grain mite, I say as a problem, it's more of a cause for concern to growers, mostly going into the fall, coming out in the spring as the wheat uh, just before it goes into dormancy or just as it comes out of dormancy, the winter grain mite can be out there in numbers and they can be feeding on those cells, removing the juice from the plant, and they can make the yellowy or silvery colored plants uh, look pretty bad, especially if we don't have good growing conditions. So I would urge growers to just as the wheat starts to break dormancy, any places in their wheat fields where they had last year that looked like there were some yellowing or some weak spots or the plants look stressed, go out and check it. Those fields may be uh, infested with winter grain mites. It takes quite a few, 20 to 50 winter grain mites per tiller, per leaf, uh, actually, to uh, cause a problem under dry conditions. Once we get rain, the winter grain mite usually won't be a problem. Now, the other mite that can be a problem, we saw it really spread east through the state last winter, you know, early spring, late winter, was the wheat curl mite. And that, that mite can be a real problem because it does vector a disease called uh, wheat streak mosaic. Problem may be an understatement here. <laughs> the, the problem can be an understatement. Normally, you know, in years past, wheat streak mosaic vectored by the wheat curl mite has only been a problem in about – one-third of the state uh, from the Colorado border, the western one-third of the state. Last year in 2017, going into 2017, in the fall 2016, we saw it spread east into the state and clear up into at least Saline County. But just last week, the KSU Plant Path Lab positively identified some samples 
that we took in from last week from Dickinson County is positively identified with wheat streak mosaic. So what that means is the mites are there because it has to be vectored by a mite, and the growers want to know what to do right now. Right now, there's really nothing to do. The the wheat is dormant. The wheat curl mite will overwinter in different stages. It can overwinter as an immature or an adult or an egg, and there's nothing you can do about it right now. So what we're urging, guys, um, just wait. As the wheat breaks dormancy, as it starts to green up, go out, and if again, if you have some places in your field that aren't greening up as you think they should, sample, make sure it's not an army cutworm because the, the army cutworm will remove the tissue. They will feed on the tissue, so it will look like there are spots out there been mowed, but the mites won't. The mites are, they suck on the juice out of the plant, so it'll make the plants look silvery or yellow, and you need to make sure if there's a winter grain mite or a wheat curl mite because winter grain mites don't transmit diseases. If it rains, they will be gone. The wheat will outgrow what damage they've produced. Wheat curl mites, a different story. If they are infected with the virus, and like I said, we found it in Saline County and Dickinson County coming east, that's a different story. Those won't be washed away as much. But the nice thing about the mites, wheat curl mites specifically, is they can't fly. They're very fragile. They can't move very far, so really it's a matter of the wind blowing them to other wheat. That's why we, last year we put on the big campaign about getting rid of your volunteer wheat because that's what provides the green bridge for all the wheat pests, really, but especially the wheat curl mite and the wheat streak mosaic. So, you know, if you have some places in, the, in your field as it starts to come back and green up, uh, get out and look and see what it is and sample. So growers take that advisory into account, and you are as well, Jeff, receiving inquiries from alfalfa growers about what's happening with the weevil. Oh, yeah, the alfalfa weevils, they overwinter, Now I say this, they overwinter as eggs and adults. In the fall of 2016, we found some larvae in December. I'm assuming those died as it got cold, but we didn't sample to follow it up. But normally they overwinter as adults and eggs. They're out. The adults are out laying eggs and feeding anytime the temperature's over 45 to 48 degrees. So this next week, uh, as it's in the 50s, the adults will be active. They'll be laying eggs, feeding a little bit. The feeding is minor; doesn't cause a problem. But in the last few years, you know, we've had 100% infested fields all throughout the state. It's just a matter of getting out to sample to note when they're feeding early so that you can uh, schedule an application of an insecticide if that's what you choose to do. The message here really is it's not too early to start thinking about these potential pest threats to crops. Yes, right now while the ground's frozen, you might get out and mark your fields where there's some problems last year uh, so that you can follow them once the weed or the alfalfa starts greening up in the spring and uh, start thinking about alternatives if there are some problems out there. And uh, we'll likely be getting back into the routine of addressing those problems as they come up here in the coming months, Jeff. So we'll welcome you back then. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension who's been on the receiving end of a number of questions from growers now about recent weather in Kansas, what that might have brought to bear on of those prevalent insects and in our crops around the state. Jeff Whitworth, our guest on this part of agriculture today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today resumes now here on the K-State Radio Network. As always, we're glad to have you along with us. Eric Atkinson here. Today's agricultural news headlines for you now, these courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, as of now, you livestock producers are not yet required to report certain emissions to the Environmental Protection Agency since a federal appeals court had not yet responded to an agency request for a delay past this past Monday's deadline. In a message posted on the agency's website, the EPA said it will not enforce the reporting requirements until the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit issues a ruling. Back in November, that court delayed until this past Monday, the rule that requires livestock producers to report emissions of more than 100 pounds per day of either ammonia or hydrogen sulfide. In its January 19th motion to delay for three months, the EPA said that producers are not yet ready to meet the requirements of that mandate. Now, the EPA has been developing guidance to help producers come into compliance with the requirements to report certain releases of these hazardous substances under the Act, according to the agency. Back in October, the EPA released its preliminary guidance, and it did solicit public input. Based on comments the EPA has received, there's still confusion among farmers, says the EPA, as to how they'll meet the reporting obligations. In April of last year, the court threw out the EPA decision not to require livestock operations to report emissions that essentially allowed the reporting rule to take full effect back in November. Animal feeding operations that can find more than 1,000 head of cattle, 2,500 head of hogs, or 125,000 chickens are defined as concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs by the EPA. Ammonia and hydrogen sulfide emitted from livestock lagoons from those operations have been classified as hazardous or extremely hazardous. In requesting a delay in the rule, the EPA said it would further allow coordination in response to what's expected to be an increase in reports made to the EPA. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association had raised a number of concerns about how this rule could affect producers. First, prior to the rule, only those cattle operations with 1,000 animals or more were are required to submit reports with the rule the NCBA says operations with as few as 200 cattle would be subject to reporting. In addition, the industry has been concerned about the costs to comply with the reporting requirements and the exposure to citizen lawsuits. Also, the NCBA has expressed concern that the data could be misused by the EPA to de- develop CAFO emission regulations through the Clean Air Act. This rule potentially, they say, could potentially affect 200,000 farms and ranches. Iowa grain companies have told Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley that the Section 199A provisions benefiting cooperatives would put them out of business if they don't do something and revise the new tax law. Grassley told agricultural reporters yesterday that he had spoken with House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Kevin Brady about the potential market problems that the new tax provision could create by pushing producers to more exclusively market to farmer cooperatives rather than than to private commodity companies. Grassley also has raised this issue with Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch. Grassley's advice to both should immediately issue a letter stating that they intend to correct the Section 199A provision and that any change would start from the date of an introduction of a bill to fix the language. In looking to replace the domestic production activities deduction in the new tax law, the new Section 199 language was added that gives farmers an extra 20% tax deduction on gross income sales and dividends from farmer cooperatives. Tax experts, cooperatives, and others have concluded that the tax change is a significant benefit for farmers who are members of a cooperative and sell to it as long as the farmer's business is not structured as a C corporation, which is excluded from taking that new 20% Section 199A deduction. Now, Grassley noted their goal was to maintain the status quo for co-ops in the rewriting of the tax reform bill. He said it wasn't an effort to create an environment which would create unfair competition against private elevators and private elevators being put out of business, in his words. Senators John Hoven of North Dakota, John Thune of South Dakota, have taken the lead in trying to fix that language, but no details have emerged on exactly how that would happen. Here in Kansas, while proposed legislation on pet animal fees would not seem to affect the livestock industry, there is a connection. Todd Domer reports on this and other agricultural issues from the Kansas Capitol. There was little action at the Kansas State House during the second week of the 2018 state legislative session. However, there were a number of bills introduced that are of interest to agriculture. 
House Bill 2477 and Senate Bill 286 are identical bills that would increase the fees for licensed facilities regulated under the Kansas Pet Animal Act. If passed, the pet animal fee increase would free up funds at the Kansas Department of Agriculture Division of Animal Health to be used in large animal health programs. Another pair of identical bills, House Bill 2478 and Senate Bill 287, would increase late fee penalties on various licenses under the authority of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. The increased late fee is applicable to both feedlot and livestock auction market licenses, among others. House Bill 2452 and the House Water and Environment Committee would limit the duration of conservation easements used for mitigation in watershed districts to the life of a project. I'm Todd Domer. And USDA officials are now saying that the demand by farmers for USDA loans seems to be down a bit from the record levels of 2016. More on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The farm economy has been struggling for at least three years, but... There have been mitigating factors to that. Which might be why demand for USDA direct and guaranteed farm loans seems to be diminishing slightly. This from the man basically in charge of the USDA Farm Service Agency Loan Portfolio, Jim Rodents. He says in fiscal year 2016, USDA obligated a record high $6.3 billion for new credit. In fiscal 17, it was only $5.9 billion with loan money still left unused. He says there could be a couple of reasons for the slight fall-off and loan demand, reasons going back to the 2016 crop year. Yields were very strong, which reduced some of the need for credit in 2017. The cattle market was a little better maybe than what folks had anticipated. So what about the loan demand in the first three and a half months of this new fiscal 2018 year? We're running at or slightly below 2017 levels. Delinquency rates steady for several years. 5% for direct loans, just over 1% for guaranteed loans. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Those today's agricultural news headlines here on Agriculture Today. Before the break, a quick reminder, check out our podcast available to you from our website. That is ksre.ksu.edu slash news. ksre.ksu.edu slash news. This is the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Encourage your grandchildren to catch it. Catch it! That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. I realize that not everyone has the time, opportunity, or desire to stand still for a moment and take a look at or even study trees. But if you have the opportunity, stop and look and maybe listen to hear what all goes on in and around the trees in front of you. Point things out to children, maybe grandchildren, when you take them for a walk in the park or neighborhood when it is not too cold. A little cold does not matter. It puts color on the cheek. It is the winter months when trees are dormant that the difference in tree shapes stand out. Of course, we know the evergreens, evergreens from deciduous trees. The latter lose their leaves and now show bare branches, and you can clearly study the individual tree form. And mind you, not every deciduous tree loses its leaves. Some will hang on to their dead and dried up leaves for a while, and you can hear the wind rustle through it if you listen on a windy day. You might even catch a falling leaf as it floats down. If safe, encourage your grandchildren to catch it. Catch it! Catch it! 
make laughter. In response to the laughter, a squirrel may chatter, annoyed about the commotion. As you look up into the tree to notice the scalding critter, you see the branch structure. And if you look, really look, you may notice that different trees have different forms and carry their branches differently. There are different tree shapes, and in a park or neighborhood landscape, most will be represented by one tree or another. Of course, there are tall, medium, and small growing trees. But here is a listing of individual tree forms found in nature. Trees can be broad, rounded, and spreading. A good example is the bur oak. They can be vase-shaped, such as the lace bark elm. They can be oval, the Bradford pear. Trees can have a pyramid shape. Think pin oak. A tree can be columnar, such as the Lombardy poplar. But oaks and other trees, several evergreens, grow along that form also. The weeping form of the weeping willow is familiar. But other trees can have the weeping shape. Even among the crab apple, there's a weeping form to be found. The irregular form could be a hackberry or golden rain tree. The fan shape on multiple stems can be redbud, staghorn sumac, or smoke tree. I was a little hesitant to name the elm tree as a V-shaped example. However, the old elm had the V-shape needed when it grazed our old streets. But because it was used so much and trees stood in long rows, when sickness or disease invaded, it took them all. However, the lace bark elm is resistant and is a beautiful tree. I have one growing next to the house. Its bark is now starting to show the orange color and fine leaf lacy bark which gives the tree its name, lace bark elm. Being winter time, the open form and branch structure can be studied. So look at it and show your grandkids. Move your arms to make the point. A narrow branch angle is more likely to suffer a break with an ice storm and heavy ice or snow load. If you walk the park after the snowfall, notice that the horizontal branches show the snow load most beautifully. The snow tends to stay on until it melts or blows off. Being winter time, I'm not talking about leaves. However, if you walk a certain round regularly with your dog or children, then it becomes fun to know a tree and look at it throughout the seasons. If it is a fruit-bearing, like oaks, look at the difference in the acorns. Like I said in the beginning, maybe you have no time, but by now you should know all trees are not equal. And if you ever go to the nursery to buy a tree or trees, know that there are choices among the many trees available. You should know your soil and the space available for a tree to grow. Why do you want a tree? Is it shade? Or do you need a windscreen and need planting a row of trees? Have you ever thought about a tree as sculpture? Such a tree, when seen against the open sky, needs to have bold, simple branch structure with no masses of little twigs. The Kentucky coffee tree would be a good selection. But now, do you want the male or the female tree. The female tree produces the large black seed pods holding the big seeds. They are very striking as a silhouette. But the male tree does not produce the seed pods. So if you think seed pods are messy, you have a choice. It's the same for the Osage orange tree or hedge tree, and you know that. You will not find those large green balls, hedge apples, under every tree. If you don't believe me, walk along a hedge row. Of course, by now, the green apples have turned brown and may have been chewed upon to get the seeds. I've not said much about tree texture, coarse, medium, or fine. But just think about the leaves, their sizes. As you walk the park or neighborhood to look at dormant trees, you 
and your grandchild will be dressed for the weather. Just tell the child, the tree cannot go to a warm place. Once selected and planted, it must grow there in its place and stand there. That means it better be adapted to climate, soil, location, and the site where it grows and wants to grow old, really old, just like Grandpa. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.